hello and good morning and welcome back again to bps and uh, as you can see this is the front page of the times of india and uh, what it has written that emergency reminds us to protect constitution this is a statement given by prime minister modi because today is june 25th and uh, every one of us know that on june 25th 1975 india saw the national emergency okay and pm modi urged protection of the constitution during the maiden session of the new lok sabha emphasizing the importance of safeguarding it from subversion now this is his own political remark but as we all know that the emergency provision it may be in the form of a national emergency it may be a state emergency or financial emergency can uh create a lot of disruption in the functioning of the constitution of india now there are separate reasons for proclamation of national emergency of a state emergency or for financial emergency but since today is june 25th so we are specifically here to talk about the national emergency and uh, under what grounds national emergency can be proclaimed and uh, uh plus what are the criteria that under which national emergency should be proclaimed or can be proclaimed and what are the constitutional provisions for it and all the, the all the rest of the related details and also we have on the 8th of june there was one specific editorial which was published in the assam tribune on the 8th of june and it is in uh, you know the entire article was written keeping in mind the background of the national emergency and what we must learn from the 2024 lok sabha elections so the entire article gave a very good view point of the indian voters how indian voters are keeping the uh, morals uh, of the constitution really really functioning and really really alive okay so the we'll discuss the article at the end of the video but before that let us move on to the basic questions like what is an emergency a state of emergency in india refers to a period of governance that can be proclaimed by the president of india during certain crisis situations so in the certain crisis uh, situation where the president of india feels that now this is a time for proclamation of emergency the emergency provisions are as you all know it is uh in this part of the constitution from article 352 to 360 this is a very basic constitutional question now what are the grounds like the national emergency can be declared on the basis of war or external aggression or armed rebellion okay on the basis of war let's say today india and china went to war so we can proclaim a national emergency external aggression the same thing or an armed rebellion let's say there is a civil war that happens within india between the government and the people so at that point of time also we can proclaim a national emergency the constitution employs the expression proclamation of emergency to denote an em emergency of this type and the article 352 the president can declare national emergency when the security of india is part of it is threatened by war or external aggression or armed rebellion that is national security is a topmost priority so in that case if the national security is threatened by any external aggression by war or by internal armed rebellion the president can order the proclamation of a national emergency they can also declare emergency even before the actual occurrence of war or armed rebellion or external aggression it is not necessary that only after the war or only after the external aggression that the president will proclaim even when the situation is such that we know that now this is completely we know that this is going to be a case of uh, is a is going to be a case of an armed rebellion is going to be a case of an external aggression so under such a situation also as a precautionary step we can take the national emergency when a national emergency is declared on the grounds of war or external aggression it is called as external emergency but if it is taken on the ground of armed rebellion it is called internal okay now this term armed rebellion is inserted from the 44th amendment and before this term it was known as internal disturbance so the term armed rebellion was only inserted from the 44th amendment and before this it was known as internal disturbance so there is no any preoccupied definition of what an armed uh, you know of what an internal disturbance is so it 
um, the internal disturbance can be you know defined or can be interpreted in a lot of di- in a lot of different ways and what happened exactly in the year of 1975 okay there was no any set of definition as to what considers an internal disturbance but if you say the term armed rebellion that means let's say if today india undergoes a civil war if the people have picked up arms against a government of india so in that case what is going to happen that it is an armed rebellion people are carrying arms people are revolting so there is a set set of definition which is been given that this is the situation under which you can proclaim emergency but if the term is given like internal disturbance so there are lot of other there are lot of other interpretations which could be given to it and the term itself could be misused which actually happened in the year 1975 now the 38 amendment of 1975 made the declaration of national emergency immune to the judicial review so this was a constitutional attack so proclamation of emergency cannot be considered as like because it, the constitution itself has given that if there are certain situations if such kind of situations occur you can proclaim an emergency but since the internal disturbance the term was not properly defined that is why it could it was uh, interpreted in a very different manner okay but let's say in the 44 um, uh, uh, sorry in the 38 amendment of 1975 what it did the national emergency in the during the proclamation it also made a constitutional attack saying that it made the national emergency immune to the judicial review now what is a judicial review as you all know that let's say the government is passing a law or has passed a law or has introduced a bill and if the bill contains any provisions which harm the id of the constitution or which alters the basic structure of the constitution the supreme court can struck it null and void and can say because the supreme court is the guardian of the constitution you the government the legislature cannot enact such laws which harm the basic structure of the constitution but in this case in the 38 amendment this particular national emergency was taken outside the purview of the judicial review that means the supreme court the court cannot interfere in the proclamation of emergency cannot interpret the constitutional validity of the national emergency proclamation but later it was de- it was deleted by the 44th amendment act of 1978 that means after 1978 this particular uh, setback was taken away and then it was again under the review of the judicial review but in the minerva mills case which happened in the 1980 the supreme court ideally said that the national emergency can be challenged in the court on the ground that the declaration was based on wholly extraneous and irrelevant facts that means you cannot go on and proclaim a national emergency just because there are certain facts you believe are real those facts can be irrelevant also can be extraneous also that means that can be uh, you know politically motivated facts also so you don't believe you cannot say that these are the facts that this is a situation that has come up if there is any politically motivated facts and if it considers if it actually uh, if it is on the ground that such kind of extraneous activities or such kind of extraneous facts has been presented which are very much politically motivated in this particular case the national emergency cannot be proclaimed and the supreme court will struck down it because when you are proclaiming a national emergency a lot of other things are going to happen the relation between the center and the state is going to affect a lot the fundamental rights are going to be suspended we'll study about this a little bit later but let's move on with uh, each and everything now with the approval how do you approve it constitutionally the proclamation of emergency must be approved by both the houses of parliament within one month from the date of its issue that means you need both the house lok sabha and the rajya sabha within a month however if the proclamation of emergency is issued at the time when the lok sabha has been dissolved uh or or the dissolution takes place during the period of 1 month without approving the proclamation then the proclamation survives until 30 days from the first sitting of lok sabha uh, after its reconstitution provided the rajya sabha has in the meantime approved it that means let's say if the lok sabha has been has been dissolved and uh, the period under which the lok sabha should approve the national emergency is given as 30 days so in this 30 days what will happen after the lok sabha new lok sabha is constituted it is going to survive 
द नेक्स्ट थर्टी डेज एंड विद इन दैट थर्टी डेज द लोकसभा हैज़ टू अप्रूव इट बट इन द मीन टाइम द राज्यसभा मस्ट अप्रूव इट इट्स नॉट बिकॉज दैट दैट राज्यसभा इज गोइंग टू वेट फॉर द लोकसभा दैट वेन द लोकसभा विल कम इन टू सेशन दे विल पास इट एंड देन वील पास इट इफ द लोकसभा इज नॉट इन द सेशन एट दैट टाइम द राज्यसभा विल पास इट इफ इट फील्स लाइक दिस इज अ जेन्यून केस एंड वेन द लोकसभा हैज कम इन टू इट्स फर्स्ट सिटिंग फ्रॉम द फर्स्ट सिटिंग टू द थर्टी डेज टिल दैट टाइम दे हैव अ टाइम टू प्रोक्लेम और दे हैव द टाइम टू अप्रूव द नेशनल इमरजेंसी इफ अप्रूव बाई बोथ द हाउसेज द इमरजेंसी कंटिन्यूज फॉर सिक्स मंथ्स एंड कैन बी एक्सटेंडेड टू एन इनडेफिनेट पीरियड विद एन अप्रूवल ऑफ द पार्लियामेंट फॉर एवरी सिक्स मंथ्स दैट मीन्स इट इज नॉट लाइक इन इट्स नॉट एन इनडेफिनेट टाइम आफ्टर एवरी सिक्स मंथ्स इट हैज़ टू कम टू द पार्लियामेंट फॉर अप्रूवल इफ द पार्लियामेंट फील्स द सिचुएशन इज नॉट Uh, good the situation is still tense it is still a matter of national security it can extend to an indefinite time but for the time being even if approved by both the houses the emergency can only last for 6 months and after 6 months you have to again approve it from the parliament from the both the houses by a special majority so a special majority you have to initiate that special majority otherwise there can be no proclamation of national emergency okay now revocation when can you revoke a, a, and how can you revoke it a proclamation of emergency may be revoked by the president at any time by subsequent proclamation such proclamation does not require parliamentary approval that means the pre- the president itself can revoke it and the president does not need to wait for the parliamentary approval the emergency must be revoked if the lok sabha passes a resolution by simple majority disapproving its continuation so if the lo- if the lok sabha says that okay now it is a time that the country can come back to the normal because our uh, external threat or internal threat has actually been uh, contained or things have been come to a certain good level so at that time if the lok sabha feels that the country can come back to the normal day to day functioning the lok sabha will initiate a resolution where by simple majority it can say that now we don't need the national emergency the president can re- revoke it and at that point of time the president will revoke the national emergency and from then on everything will come back to normal the every constitutional setup of the center and state will come back to the normal the way they used to function now effects effect on the center state relation why center and state because we know that we have a central government we have a state government we have a central legislature we have a state legislature so now there are central subjects and also there are state subjects now there are certain subjects where the center can make laws and there are certain specific state state subjects where the state is uh, ultimately the, the state make laws so these are certain common things uh, i'm pretty sure you know now the executive the center becomes entitled to give executive directions to a state on any matter that means the executive direction the center will tell the state that these are the kind of administrative protocol you have to follow during the time of the national emergency and the state is liable to understand or follow the guidelines of the center now parliament becomes empowered to make laws on any subject mentioned in the state list the president can issue ordinance on state subjects also if the parliament is not in session the laws made on state subjects by the parliament become inoperative 6 months after emergency has to cease to be in operation so if the national emergency is in proclamation every state subjects every law on the state subject will be enacted by the parliament will be enacted by the center the state legislature is definitely it's been uh, uh, you can say they don't have any right to frame any kind of laws or whatsoever but let's say if the national emergency has ceased to exist then after 6 months of it then again they will come back to the normal one they will again come back to the normal functioning and again the state government will come and enact laws as per the constitutional mandate that it is given to them okay so only on the time of the national emergency the state legislature is not permitted to make any laws on the state subjects also it is only the parliament which can make laws because we give priority to the national so we give priority to the national security the nation should survive the country should survive and everything will come later that is why these kind of things these kind of constitutional or uh, uh, these kind of constitutional or ar- ar- uh, arrangements are done now effects on the center state relations of for the financial matter the president can modify constitutional distribution of revenue between center and the state the president can 
modify that means earlier everything the finance commission used to you know make certain uh, allo allocation that this that this much money has to be sent from the center to the state so it was a duty of the finance commission to decide but now in the national emergency time it is the president who can make or modify certain laws let's say if today china attacks india then china is going to be very closer to northeast india and other regions in the himalayan regions so now the center will feel that we need to spend more money on the borders on the states bordering china so at that point of time the pre the president will say that we need to modify the financial uh, the financial relation between the center and the state okay so that is how the things are done now on the legislature when a proclamation of national emergency is in proclamation or, or is in operation the life of lok sabha may be extended beyond the normal ten term for one year at a time that means if the lok sabha has let's say for five years then they can also make a one more term that means one more they can extend that time however this extension cannot continue beyond a period of 6 months after emergency has ceased to operate that means if the emergency time is this much if the emergency has finished that means after 6 months the uh, legislature the lok sabha will also get dissolved after that 6 month similarly the parliament may extend the normal tenure of state legislative assembly by 1 year time during a national emergency so it depends upon the parliament what they need to do with the state legislatures if they feel like they need to extend one year term they can extend but these are certain constitutional provisions which are given by the constitution during the time of national emergency because the constitution feels that the nation should be protected so that is why these kind of certain rigorous uh, uh, arrangements were been pro have been provided now on the fundamental rights the most important part is article 358 and 359 they describe the effect of national emergency on the fundamental right now suspension of article 19 now article 19 we have six fundamental right that is right to speech and we have right to freedom of speech right to movement and all those six under fundamental basic rights all of whom remain suspended during the time of national emergency okay now if uh, the 44th amendment act laid out that article 19 can only be suspended when the national emergency is laid on the grounds of war or external aggression and not in the case of armed rebellion that means after 44th amendment what it said that you can only suspend article 19 if the national emergency is proclaimed on the ground of external aggression if china attacks india at that point the government can or the president can suspend article 19 but if it is in the case of an armed rebellion if there is a civil war if there is an armed rebellion you cannot suspend article 19 you have you have to give all the six fundamental rights to the people okay now under article 359 the president is authorized to suspend by order the right to move any court for the enforcement of fundamental rights during a national emergency so under article 359 president is authorized to suspend any person's right to move to court for enforcement of fundamental rights but the suspension could be for a period during the operation of emergency or for a shorter period but the 44th amendment act mandates that the president cannot suspend the right to move to court for the enforcement of fundamental rights guaranteed on the article 20 and 21 that means uh, prevention against unlawful de uh, unlawful detention these are the certain and also we have article right to life now the 44th amendment as you can see the 44th amendment has made major major changes to the entire constitutional uh, to the entire constitutional provisions during the time of national emergency now what it has said that now there you cannot uh, you cannot suspend any person's right to move to the court during a case of national emergency because that person might need to move to court for justice justice is something it is not going to wait for a specific period if there is injustice going on you have to go somewhere uh, you have to go for adjudication you have to go for you know uh, seeking your own rights for defending your own rights for seeking justice so these are the certain things which are basic human rights you cannot uh, debar these rights from a person so that is why the 44th Am amendment act said that in case if it is a national emergency also you cannot take away the right of a person to move to court if for the enforcement of fundamental rights under article 21 and 20 
Now on the 8th of June, there was a very interesting article which was published in the Assam Tribune editorial. If you have not seen my class, you can go and see the class. I did this. Uh, we do a weekly Assam Tribune analysis and the article was the inscrutable uh, Indian voter. Inscrutable. The word is very much flanky but inscrutable that means you cannot screw this Indian voter. You cannot take him for granted. You cannot uh, seek that Indian voter. They are stupid. They don't know anything. Because in the 2024 Lok Sabha elections we saw how Indian people voted. What they really wanted. What their problems were. And the Indian voter said that if there is certain if there are certain issues which are persistent in our country or in the region or in our constituency, we are going to look at if the person is reliable, if the person has solved that problem or not. Anybody, anybody who has solved the problem of the constituency or of the region has got the vote and anybody who has not solved the problem has not got the vote. So, so now people are actually, uh, the, pe the people are actually deciding whether that person or that uh, that or that candidate has performed well uh, after being elected or not what he did for the constituency what he did not do for the constituency so indian voter has really over the period of time has become really really responsible but this article explores the background of the 1975 em emergency period and the Ele elections which was conducted in the year 1977 after the national emergency proclamation so this is mrs indira gandhi now the Allahabad high court in 1975 had declared that the election of the then indian prime minister indira gandhi is null and void and prohibited her from contesting in the election for the next six years that means the Allahabad high court said that her il election was null and void so so she cannot contest but she immediately recommended the president Fakhruddin Ali Ahmed to declare the state of emergency ostensibly to empower her to tackle the disorder and lawlessness following the court's decision. A captive president obeyed her wishes and declared a state of emergency caused by internal disorder on June 25th. Now give importance to the word internal disorder. Before the coming of the 44th am amendment, the 38th amendment, uh, the 38th constitutional provision said that the national emergency could be proclaimed on the grounds of an internal disorder so if you remember at that point of time there was a huge protest going on uh, under the leadership of Jay Prakash Narayan which was known as total revolution and all the opposition leaders the Congress or the Janta Dal and everybody they came to, uh, they came together and they started protesting against a uh, uh, against the against a government against a government of Ind Indira Gandhi and in that backdrop the Allahabad High Court said that her il elections were null and void. So under such circumstances when the India when the entire political situation of India was in a state of bubble the Allahabad High Court gave the verdict that the il election to the uh, of Mrs. Indira Gandhi is null and void so she cannot contest in the election for the next six years and during that time it was a break that time was a movement where the entire total revolution it spread out wild like a wildfire and in, in that backdrop the, the situation was such that the entire country the entire country came together to protest against a dictatorial government and it is this in this backdrop that she proclaimed the emergency saying that the disorder and lawlessness following the court's decision so that is why i was i was telling you that the constitution only gave the term internal disturbance now there is no any de any de any definition of what internal disturbance means many people can have different interpretation of the term internal disturbance and that is why the term was changed later to the armed rebellion okay now between 1975 and 77 the fundamental rights of citizens were suspended and the bureaucracy was invested with extraordinary power to arrest and imprison citizens without trial that means now you remember that by 44th amendment what it said the supreme court said that uh, that any person can go to the court for defending his fundamental right under article 20 and 21 that means uh, a prevention against harmful or illegal illegal de illegal detention but this thing was not there at that point of time so what happened is 
fundamental rights were suspended and anybody who was found to in fact anybody who was found to you know lobby or any kind of thing even if he was not lobbying or even if he was not doing anything that also the if the police felt that this is a suspect he is a person who is creating problem they used to pick him up and then go and put him in the prison without any trial and then bureaucracy was also invested with extraordinary power to do that okay now nearly 1 lakh 40 thousand people were arrested now now this is not i have i have not written this this is the article which i got on the 8th of june on the assam tribune editorial so don't take this as my words take this from the article okay abbreviations such as custodial death and forced sterilization took place as you all know that is custodial that means if the police uh, suspects somebody that okay this person is a problematic one he's doing some problem he's creating certain mischievous things so they used to pick him up and put him in prison and then the police used to you know do all their uh, you know torture first degree second degree third degree whatever is they, they used to beat him up and then many of times what happened many people used to die custodial death that means they used to die in the custody of police itself and then there was forced sterilization that means anybody the it doesn't matter whether you are married unmarried you have children you don't have a children whether you are doing family planning or not it was forced sterilization people were bought in from uh, you know in the cars or in the trucks and then they used to do a forced mass ster sterilization opposition leaders were either a were either arrested or forced to go underground any people any politic any politician who was found to protest against the government was also put to prison so many a times the opposition leaders many were them went underground the media was bro beaten that means media was not allowed to report such kind of things media was not allowed there was a lot of censorship on media the print media they could not you know publish a lot of news even the electronic media at that point of time in the 1975 not many people used to have tv but they used to have radio and things like this so the media was uh, to a such an extent control that the media was not allowed to report the atrocities during the time of the emergency period and the bureaucracy was rendered thoroughly submissive the bureaucrats had to listen to the government and the judiciary and legislature were coerced into submission that means the judicial the judicial power was reduced to such an extent that the ju the ju the, ju the judiciary was left with no power to in fact protect the ideals of the constitution the judiciary was rendered useless and the legislature was also as 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 you know the op opposition was jailed or in fact everything so everything was under the control of the government but fortunately she lifted from 1975 to 77 it was uh it was nearly two years and from then she lifted the emergency in 1977 so as i was saying the emergency period as per the constitution what is given that you can only if both the houses of the parliament also approve a state of national emergency it can only last for a period of six months and after six months again both the legislature the upper house and the lower house has to approve if they need the continuation of the of the um, of the emergency period so you must understand that how the entire how the entire house or the or the legislature was controlled to such an extent that they had to give approval for the continuation of em emergency for a period of two years okay for a period of uh, two years after every six months but fortunately she lifted because things came down very cool and then till 1977 everything was the things came back to normal but the indian voter they did not forget this the indian voter grabbed it to make clear its disapproval when she conducted the elections indira gandhi was swept out of power that means nobody voted for her she lost terribly at the at the general elections even undergoing the ignominy of losing her own election that means she lost from her own constituency also okay the opposition calling itself the janta dal and comprising the congress the socialist the bhartiya janasang the bhartiya kranti dal everybody came to, uh, came uh, together and between there was a fight 
at or a fight to choose between democracy and dictatorship was thrust into power indira gandhi was cut down to size by the inscrutable indian voter so indian voter knew even if the situation came a little bit normal after 1970 or till 1977 but the indian voter did not forget the indian voter said that this is the election where we have to choose between the dictatorship and the democracy but the indian voter chose a democracy in fact she lost from her own constituency also from her own uh, place also and then this is what the writer this is what the editor is trying to say that these are the examples from our history from our past political setup that we have seen that the india you should never take the indian voter very lightly now there are a lot of other opinions which are going on in you know uttar pradesh that how B- bjp lost in Ay- ayodhya how B- how bjp lost in uttar pradesh now the controversy surrounding ag- around the ram temple i don't have to make any comments on that but if you go to the ground if you see all those ground reporters you will find that majority of the cons- of the places in the uttar pradesh were not equally developed many a times the roads were not pro- the roads were not properly built the local leader did not do much for the people there so the indian voter knew that there are certain things that we expect from our representative this is why we have voted you to power we expect you to do certain things but if you are not doing it if you are not doing what is sup- what you are supposed to do if you are not do- doing the kind of development that you are supposed to do that means the indian voter has the right to bring you to take you out of power and this is what happened so the writer the editor is giving us an example that how efficient how democratic the indian voter is the indian voter knows whom to vote what to vote and in case of the of a dictatorship or de- or democracy indian voter is always going to choose the condition of the de- of the de- of the democracy no matter what so even if we say that indian voters don't understand democracy indian voters don't understand what real democracy means it is not like that many a times the voter is very much conscious of whom he wants into power because he knows what is happening in the ground he has seen his own constituency he has seen his own ex- from his own experiences so sometimes in politics in indian politics especially in the history itself also right from this emergency example also we have seen that when there is a struggle between de- between democracy and dictatorship the <coughs> win is always for the democracy now i am not making any po- any political comment on any political leader whatsoever but this is the trend of the indian voter so if there is a question on indian voter on the voting behavior or or the voting pattern if there is a, any specific question you can give this very extraordinary example to prove your point that indian voter is really efficient indian voter is really knowledgeable and indian voter keeps uh does not want to be taken for granted and is ready to cut down to size anyone who attempts to do so okay so if you take the constitution for granted if you take indian voter for granted then indian voter will cut you down to size because they know whom to vote what to do and what not to do so this is a perfect example of uh, how efficient or how knowledgeable the indian voter is and how accountable the indian voter is so that is why uh, how and how responsible they are so if you have a question on the voting behavior you can give this as an primary example it will be very good for you now her tale is an excellent illustration of this reality who keeps years close to to the ground the indian voters keeps years close to the ground they are not going to see in the national level what is happening they are going to see what in their own constituency what things have been done so this is a very good thing for a indian democracy for any democracy the voter must be uh, responsible the voter must know what is happening in his own constituency it it never matters what politician it is from which political party he belongs if he is doing the right thing for the people if he is doing the right thing for his own constituency he is going to get the get the support of the people so this is what the indian voter tries to say the just concluded lok sabha election are a reiteration of this reality a startling reminder to our political leaders of the people's absolute commitment to the democratic ideals so we always believe that we as a voter 
we are very much com we are very much committed to the democratic ideals of our constitution because from our own history of freedom struggle we have understood that how important the democratic rights are for a country and for the people so nothing stands in our way nothing is going to stand in our way only democracy will stand only constitution is going to stand okay even in the case of a national emergency because national emergency is a situation where you give priority to the national security rather than the fundamental rights but that doesn't mean that in case if you are giving that does not give you the right to you know do whatever the thing you want whatever uh, you know uh, that does not give you the right to abuse the power you can proclaim national em emergency if there is actually a situation of an armed rebellion or external aggression the constitution gives you the right to proclaim it because national be because national security should be the priority but in that case the constitution also does not give you the power to abuse that particular constitutional right okay so this was today's uh, so everything that we had to do from this so if you have any questions if you have any comments please write it down and we are trying to bring everything that is re is relevant every news items which is very relevant from an exam point of view we are trying to bring it in front of you so uh, if you have any questions if you have any comments please do write it down to us and thank you